Special thanks to Tokyo Treat and Sakurako for sponsoring today's video. Before we get started, there will be spoilers for the Thousand Year Blood War arc of Bleach in the video to come. With the release of the Thousand Year Blood War arc anime part 2 on Blu-ray, we've received a wave of new information on episodes 14 through 26, including an in-depth interview with series director Tomohisa Taguchi, which details some of the creative choices behind the second core, and the battle between the Gote 13 and the Vandenreich. In this video, I want to move through Taguchi's answers and explanations for several pressing topics, including certain characters, sequences, and the second core in general, while discussing them and giving my overall thoughts as we go. There's quite a lot of interesting information here, as Taguchi addresses everything from the Sternritter and their portrayal, to more Irazu Sando lore, and even the controversial Red Sky itself. Honestly, it's great to get this kind of insight, to get a detailed breakdown of the creative process behind something you love so much. Getting a window into the behind-the-scenes world that went into making it is awesome and helps us be more informed when it comes to discussing the anime itself in the future. Before we begin, a huge thank you goes out to Reddit user Schneisel for putting together the initial post, which I've linked in the description if you want to have a read as well. So, without further ado, let's take a look at some of these answers. First of all, Taguchi discusses Yuha Bark and the way they presented the Quincy King's backstory, as was originally shown in Chapter 565, God Like You. His answer reads as follows. We thought we would open the second core with Yuha Bark and link it to the first season. In the manga, Yuha Bark's birth is depicted in the form of a folklore passed down. In the anime, we were worried how to portray such a scene, thus we used an art film style theme without narration or dialogue. The genesis of Yuha Bark went through many changes on the storyboard and each visualisation was very interesting, even the initial drafts. We wanted to use the holy chant of Yuha Baha during his birth scene. And we also wanted to link the first words of Yuha Bark in the opening scene of the first season with him singing the Kaiser Gesang to his birth. So, my initial thought is that I'm not surprised Yuha Bark's backstory underwent a lot of revisions and changes. There's no doubt that God Like You, especially with how it's almost arbitrarily positioned between two major fights, is a difficult chapter to adapt. That being said, I think they did a great job here. There's a focus on showing and not telling, which is a notion that will come up again throughout his interview. And while quite a hefty chunk of God Like You is removed in the final product, I think the overall message still comes across really well, maybe even better in some ways. Yuha Bark is truly portrayed as a sinister god in the opening of the season, and I think they managed to convey what's going on even without any dialogue. Plus, the chanting of Yuha Bark's name is very effective at establishing the idea of this growing cult of personality that's now beginning to fester around this antichrist-like figure. About Taguchi's comment regarding linking the scene of Yuha Bark's birth back to the opening of the first season, it makes me wonder if each season will open with some kind of insight into Yuha Bark's world, or some kind of monologue or narration from him. I recently discussed in my video looking at 13 potential new scenes we could get in part 3, at the possibility of opening part 3 with a look at the Still Silver Arrow. While I still think that's possible, I wonder what else they might use the opening scene for now. Could that be where we learn more about the Soul King, perhaps with a narration by Yuha Bark himself? Moving on, Taguchi next discusses Hashwolf, or specifically a particular aspect of his character and how it ties into Yuha Bark, saying, There were other depictions of Yuha Bark's power which we showed without dialogue, such as Hashwolf appearing the moment Yuha Bark fell asleep, switching by means of the shadows. In the manga, Hashwolf explains the connection, but we actually wanted to show it. Since it is of immense interest in the later part of Bleach, we thought incorporating this early on would be good. We gave the shadows a sliding appearance to depict the transfer of power. Since Yuha Bark's power is transferred while he is asleep, we made Hashtwalth appear with his head down to preserve the nuance 
of sleep. So yeah, this was a cool addition. Hashworth quite literally teleporting into the throne room in place of Yuharbark, while Yuharbark himself seemingly melts into the shadows and disappears as the two trade roles come nightfall. This is the kind of creative liberty that makes sense for the anime to take, and it's great to get the rationale behind it, as it is quite a substantial change. But with Taguchi noting the importance of the concept to the latter half of the arc, I suspect this isn't the last time we've seen this little manoeuvre, and it's definitely smart to actually show that transfer of power in a physical, tangible way, rather than just have Hashwalth espouse it to Uryu. Plus, speaking of Uryu, having him there helps too. He acts as the audience surrogate, as neither he nor we have any idea what we just saw, really. I guess it helps to emphasise that yes, this is a literal swapping of places between the ruler and the one who comes to wear the mask of the ruler at night. Here's hoping more continues to be done with Hashwolf's character in the coming parts, helping us to get more insight into him. Next, Taguchi says, We hoped to show the difference in leadership between Yamaji and Kyoraku by adding a scene in which he issues orders to each squad member. We wanted to show the status of each Shinigami so that the viewers would be clear of the ever-changing war situation. His kindness while talking to Tatsuki, Keigo and Mizuiro depict his character as well as the nature of the change in his work as the new Captain Commander of the Gotei. We added scenes of Hinamori, Iba, Hisagi, Isane, Ikaku and Yumichika to show exactly how they were faring in the war and their stubborn resistance. Regarding Kyoraku, I think they managed to capture that fairly well. To be honest, I think the source material already does a great job of highlighting the different leadership styles, and that's only going to become more apparent in the next couple of parts. But yes, adding the extra scene of Kyoraku conversing directly with the Gote 13 over the phone, which is the scene I assume he's referring to, was a nice touch. I remember wondering if that was going to lead anywhere, and it never really does, but knowing there's a real reason for it being there is certainly nice and lends it some extra weight. Moving on though, Taguchi mentions how they tried to focus in on the other Shinigami officers spread out across the battlefield, characters like some of the vice captains, for example, and that certainly was noticed. I've always said that one of the best aspects of the Thousand Year Blood War arc is how much it feels like an actual war in comparison to the battle with Yarankar, and a huge huge reason for that is seeing the foot soldiers in action, seeing characters spread out all over the place, fighting their individual battles both big and small, and so the addition of these extra scenes was both noticeable and appreciated. Characters like Eber got absolutely nothing to do in the original story, even if he gets just one additional shot here where he's clashing with a soldat, at least we know he's actually engaged in battle. Up next we have easily the biggest insight of them all. Essentially, Taguchi breaks down the team's approach to Ichigo and his story during part two, as of course Ichigo had not only some new scenes, but essentially a brand new storyline to contend with. I'll read the entire answer and then we can break it down into sections. We wanted the highlights of the second season to be the stern ritter, but Bleach is still the story of Ichigo, so we paralleled his scenes at the end of the episodes, since in the manga there were several chapters in which Ichigo doesn't appear. Thus, we depicted the training he undergoes while the rest of the Shinigami are fighting in the war. In the manga, it was mentioned that he trained specifically with Ichibe Hyosabe, but it wasn't drawn. While Kubo Sensei wanted to include this but wasn't able to, he had a very clear image in mind, so he told me precisely precise details, and I was surprised by the incredible amount of extra information. It made me very happy. Kubo Sensei wanted to include the Yarazu Sando theme in the manga, but due to certain restraints, he simply couldn't. Ichigo's suffering would extend over several pages, and the panelling would not work with Ichigo and the rest of the Shinigami fighting in parallel. And so we were glad to show everything through the means of the anime. Yarazu Sando is a sort of theatre, with its enigmatic beauty. It is calm, awe-inspiring and majestic. There's a Shinto Tori gate with paper curtains and a stone platform. I don't think I would have reached this level of comprehension if Kubo-sensei had not guided me regarding the meaning of this place. 
The Arazu Sandor pathway tries to push people away from the stone road, and the more one tries to resist the push, the heavier the Bokuto the wooden sword gets. Ichigo dragged his feet forward to not stray away from the stone pathway. There is meaning as well in the rain that falls beyond. The Arazu Sandor, in my opinion, is a unique training ground that is not found in any other shonen manga, because it is so beautiful with a strange atmosphere of complete silence. The images Ichigo witnesses while walking on the Arazu Sandor path are very important, as they shall be explained later on in the remaining seasons. We would be very grateful if you could re-watch the Urazu Sandor memories and what happens to Ichigo's eyes. Rather than being sacred, as it seems, the pathway of Urazu Sandor is actually cursed, but we did not tell the rest of the animation team this because we felt they would consider it to be too dark. The training ground is supposed to give an impression of a very old, abandoned, decrepit, and terrifying shrine. As the story would become very scary, we somehow managed to balance the terrifying aspect with the beauty. Kubo Sensei made sure that we could depict the Urazu Sando as an Inca Hall. Inca means a philosophical seal, in which obtaining the seal is considered to be the highest form of understanding one's innermost soul. Inca translates to transmission, in which a student receives his teacher's philosophies. Here, Ichigo's Zen Buddhist teacher is the monk, and Ichigo obtains the seal from Ichibe Hyosabe. The status, then, of Ichigo's soul has been uplifted. In the same context as the training area under Urahara's shop, the path of Urazu Sandor is underneath the monk's sitting ground. As one walks through the Urazu Sandor road, they are not supposed to look upon the stone path, but focus on the Tori gate instead. Ichigo suffered because his gaze was on the stone. The heavier his steps became, the Tori gate turns whiter and whiter. Originally, the Tori Gate was black, the essence of Ichibe Hyosabe, and the rain that falls outside makes the body decay, so if Ichigo had strayed off the road, his body would have rotted away. Ooh, that was quite the answer, so let's break it down and dive into this thing. Firstly, I'm really happy to hear that the team's focus was on making the Sternritter the highlights of the season, and it definitely feels that way. Even though a huge number of them are killed, the core really is all about them. From their brand new meeting at the start of episode 15 right the way through, this set of 13 episodes is dedicated to showing the immense clash between the two sides and putting our new enemies in the spotlight. However, it's also refreshing to hear Taguchi reiterate that Bleach remains Ichigo's story at its heart. Now, this is an issue that's persisted for a long time, and depending on who you ask, it's a major problem with the source material. There are times where Ichigo is completely gone for multiple volumes in a row. For example, the fake Karakura Town battle or the second Quincy invasion. Now, I personally have never minded this, as I adore Bleach's supporting cast too, just as much if not more so than Ichigo in some cases. But from a narrative perspective, it is undeniably weird to have your main character absent for such long periods of time. That's why the team's decision to actually show us what's going on with Ichigo makes so much sense, and to continue to ground the wider goings-on of the war back with our main character every now and then. It's very interesting to me to hear that Kubo wanted to show Ichigo's training with Ichibe, though not all that surprising. It was always weird that the leader of the Zero Division never got his moment in the Royal Palace training arc while most of the others did, and it definitely felt like Kubo ran out of time where that was concerned. But it's also not surprising for another reason, the existence of Irazu Sandor in the first place. This is a fully-fledged concept, a brand new piece of lore, and it's clear that Kubo came up with this entire sequence before being unable to implement it in the original story. It's for reasons like this that the Thousand Year Blood War arc anime doesn't replace the source material. In my eyes, at least, they complement each other and are both canon. Events that don't happen in one happen in the other, and they come together to create a clearer image. 
But it's awesome that Kubo is getting the chance to explore these concepts and ideas that he couldn't before so many years later, and hearing that he personally supplied an extraordinary amount of information is wonderful. Taguchi then details exactly how Irazu Sandor works. Now, Irazu Sandor being this totally new thing introduced in the story is something we've discussed at length lately, but it is cool to learn more. It's interesting to note that the path is designed to forcibly push people away from the stone road, and the more one tries to resist, the heavier the wooden sword they're holding becomes. I agree with him as well when he notes that the Arazu Sandor feels very unique as far as training grounds go, and it really is one of the most mystical and beautiful landscapes in the anime. However, you know me, and you'll know that what Taguchi said next is by far the most exciting point. He notes that the images Ichigo witnessed while walking the Urazu Sandor path are very important as they shall be explained later on. Of course, the images in question are the fleeting glimpses of the Soul King's backstory and the origin of how he became the lifeless puppet that we see today. As mentioned in my recent video about the 13 potential new scenes, and as I've reiterated ad nauseum at this point, this is something I am desperate to see. The narrative and world building of Bleach will never feel truly complete to me without it with such a gaping hole in the centre. So if this really is what it seems, confirmation that we might get some kind of explanatory, revelatory flashback as I hope and predict, then that is genuinely fantastic news. The notion that Irazu Sando is cursed but dressed up to appear sacred is excellent imagery too. It's essentially a metaphor for Rayo himself, after all, and the team's attempts at balancing terror with beauty are smart. There's just an awful lot of enlightening but small details here, and I love the fact that Kubo had such a hand in the pathway's design and meaning. I wonder if Ichibei's words, that he believes Ichigo has become a true Shinigami and even gone beyond that, stem from this idea that the Arazu Sando allows someone to attain the highest form of understanding of their own soul. Obviously, understanding himself, learning who he really is, what he really is, is the essence of Ichigo's arc in the Thousand Year Blood War arc, right the way from everything but the rain to the blade is me and now this. How does this compare to the idea of transcendence, I wonder? Transcendence is an interesting concept in that it's mostly completely dropped after the Arankar arc and Aizen's defeat. Upon his transcendence, I assume Ichigo's soul changed forever, even after he lost his powers and then regained them. And this is the moment where he finally understands who he is. I maintain that Ichigo's training against White Tensor in the Deicide arc is essentially exactly the same thing as The Blade Is Me. The difference is that in Deicide, Ichigo is receiving all these blessings, albeit temporarily, but has no idea what's really going on with his own soul. He's just kind of going along with it. In The Blade Is Me, he finally learns the actual truth and gains those blessings, but forever. I also love the small detail that the rain outside of the Urazu Sandor forces the body to decay. So the pathway is trying to get people to walk out into that rainfall to decay and wither away. I assume the rotting of the body would have been literal and resulted in actual death. I think I mentioned this before, but I assume others have walked Irazu Sandor before Ichigo. There's no way this thing just exists for him in this moment. So it really is a do or die situation for those who find themselves on it, and that becomes even darker when you remember Ichigo never actually asked to walk the path, nor even knew what it really was. But of course, rain is very symbolic in Bleach, particularly where Ichigo is concerned. The rain has always been a signifier of the very worst things in his life coming to bear, of obstacles and hurdles that need to be overcome, whether it's the death of his mother or his own personal depression manifested. And so it makes sense to me that here, at what is ostensibly the end of his journey, his final obstacle is the rain in a much more literal sense. If he succumbs and walks out into the rain, it's like he's giving in to everything he's fought so hard against all these years. But this time, it will cost him the world. Of course, Ichigo succeeds, however, and emerges as a changed man as a result. So yeah, quite an in-depth look at Ichigo's arc in the second Quincy invasion, which makes sense seeing as it was completely missing from the source material. Before we continue on with the rest of Taguchi's comments, first a message from today's sponsor. 
Well, as you can see from these majestic box designs, the Sakura festivities continue long into the night this month, as Tokyo Treat and Sakurako celebrate the Yozakura, or the nighttime cherry blossoms and the festivals that accompany them. When the Sakura are viewed in the light of the moon, they come to life in mesmerizing fashion. This month's boxes hope to capture some of that sensation by offering plenty of themed snacks and picked to help you enjoy the majesty of Yozakura from the comfort of your own home, and and Mrs. Tomo and I are here to help guide the way. Now, as you can see, both Tokyo Treat and Sakurako come jam-packed with seasonal Japanese snacks each month, but the experiences on offer are very different. Tokyo Treat is a monthly pop Japanese snack subscription box that includes up to 20 seasonal snacks, including instant ramen and drinks, only available in Japan for a limited time. This month's theme is Sakura Matsuri Snack Fest, acting as a sequel of sorts to last month's Hanami celebration. This time, Tokyo Treat has encapsulated the vibe and feel of the nighttime cherry blossom viewing festivals, with snacks including a Sakura cream cake, platinum Sakura sweet tart, and some premium Ghana chocolates. Right, so as always, we're going to be starting with Tokyo Treat snacks, but this time, Jade has planned a little something different. We can't just dig right in for some reason. She's making it so that we have to earn them, or at least I have to earn them anyway through some kind of a quiz testing yeah. me on chapter titles from Bleach. Is that right? Definitely. Yeah, I think you've just, we've had it too easy. There's been no challenge. We just sit here and we eat things. So I thought, mm. let's, uh, let's bring the quiz back. He's weirdly good. So we're Only gonna... in the Thousand Year Blood War. But that has to be the the, the ground rules, the housekeeping. So if you fail, I get the snack. He wins, he gets the snack. So Tom, mm. your first one. Chapter 487. Oh no, <laughs> that's, already, that's yes. already quite a difficult one. Yes! 484 is the Buckbeard, 485 is Foundation Stones, 486... Something about Crimson Cremation? Is that 486 or is that 487? That's 486. Oh god, I don't know what 487 is then. <laughs> Can you give me a clue? Yeah. You need to do it to live. Oh, come on, I'm giving oh, uh, you... Oh, breathe but blind. I'll give you that, purely because you got the three... That's chapters. right, isn't yes, it? Yes, that's correct. Yes. But I'm only giving that to you because you got the three before it, correct? Yeah, you right. needed quite a lot of help God, there. you picked a hard one to start us off. All right, go on. Well, here's your prize. So you've got the Platinum Sweet Treat. He's got it. <laughs> it's like a little Sakura boat. I was thinking it's like a boat, yeah. That's a winning boat, Tom. It's White bean paste we've not really had much of. No, it's usually red beans, isn't it? Mm. I can definitely get the Sakura flavour, mostly, I think. Mm. It's cute. It is cute, yeah. Mm. 495. Ah! That's a... Yes! You picked one of my favourite chapter titles in Bleach! Brilliant. Bleeding Guitar Blues. That is one of the... That's one of the coolest chapter titles in the series. So is that it? Are I getting on yeah, the street now? Yeah, 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 okay, well, what are... Yeah, it's like... <laughs> Oh wow, this God, is squishy. So look at that. Cool. Look at the top. It's like a little burger. Oh, yeah, look it's at that. It's got a little Sakura flower on it. That's, That's so nice. cute. That's very cute. So this is a Sakura cream cake. It's filled with real cherry juice. That's amazing. Oh, nice. Oh, it's so pink. Mm. Yeah, you earned that one. That's lovely, yep. Meanwhile, Sakurako supports local Japanese snack makers with a focus on traditional artisan Japanese snacks as well as authentic Japanese tea. Each box also comes with a lovely piece of Japanese tableware, including this month's box is an ornately decorated Sakura glass a collaboration between Sakurako and Ishizuka Glass. The theme for Sakurako this month is a night of Sakura, which puts the focus on the natural beauty of the season and how best to experience it, including snacks such as cherry blossom yokan, strawberry butter senbei, and some blueberry hibiscus tea. What about 512? Uh, the stand ablaze? Oh my god! <laughs> That used to be called Everything But The Rain, but then Kubo changed it because Everything But The Rain became the past. I remember past that, thing. Everything But The Rain. Yeah. So, first up we've got Strawberry Manju. Beautiful. Doughy. That's very, yeah, that's fa that's nice and satisfying to be fair, gone. Come on, split it in half. That's good Manju. Here you go, you can have this. <laughs> you can have this slither. This is really mean. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that's you... very soft, I like that. I want the full last, name here. The full name, This okay. is probably the longest name on here. Chapter 644. I will wait. This is what we've got up for grab, guys, while Tom contemplates everything. White <laughs> chocolate, strawberry, oh, delicious. God. A delicious I... treat. Well, it's chapter 644. That's the last chapter of Myri versus Pernoda. So it's baby hold your hand something rather than that. It's a long fight, but baby hold your hand doesn't appear until three or four chapters in. 636, 637. I don't know. <sighs> baby hold your hand six? 
that's not right. I'll let you have it if you get the rest of the brackets. Is it something like the never ending sleep or something like that? Or nearly. The never ending dream? It's something like yeah, that. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's not the English isn't correct, but never ending my dream. Oh, yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I mean, if you want to give it to me, it's up to you. That was difficult. Here you go. Good Thank prize, you. Sir. Thanks very much. A romantic dream. Mm, yeah. That's cool, isn't it? That's nice. Well done, Tom. Thank you. And of course, as mentioned earlier, no matter which box you choose, each one comes with a detailed booklet that tells you everything you need to know about the snacks inside, including allergen information. Find out more about the theme of the month as well. For example, the Tokyo Treat booklet this month spotlights Hirosaki Castle, a palace of petals known for being a wonderful Yozakura hotspot. But that's it for April's beautiful Yozakura themed boxes. As always, I want to say a big thank you to Tokyo Treat and Sakurako for supporting the channel by sponsoring today's video. If you want to treat yourself or someone you know to one of these boxes to help see out the season of cherry blossoms in style, then make sure to follow the links down in the description and the pinned comment and use my code for five dollars off of your purchase. Thanks everyone and enjoy. After that, Taguchi detailed the reasoning behind the bold colour choices throughout the core, specifically those of the transformed Seireite after the Vandenreich's invasion. Going on to say, we wanted the red sky and the buildings to be blue because we wanted to establish that the blue of the Quincy's had completely overtaken the red of the Shinigami. Only the bottom of the dome retains the colour of the Shinigami, the sky. The Quincy's who had been hiding in the shadows had risen above ground and only vestiges of the pride of the Shinigami remain high up in the sky. Considering how divisive the red sky has been, it's certainly interesting to get the director's own take on why the choice was made. I like the concept and I like the theory behind it. Thematically, it makes sense. This idea of the blue of the Quincy's completely taking everything over and I never really thought of it like that. However, I'm also not sure it really makes sense. He mentions the blue of the Quincy's completely overtaking the red of the Shinigami, but firstly, the red sky was introduced by the Vandenreich and their shadow transformation. It's got nothing to do with the Shinigami in a literal sense anyway. And secondly, I would argue the blue buildings don't really overtake the red. The red is by far the most prominent colour in virtually every single shot. So that doesn't make much sense to me ultimately, but I do like the visualisation of the Quincy's rising up out of the ground, out of the shadows, and pushing the Shinigami's pride upwards, that's a cool visual. Next, we have a few smaller insights that we can somewhat breeze through. Firstly, Taguchi says of Mayuri's sunsuit, we wanted Mayuri Kurotsuchi's clothes to look like the many coloured circuit boards of gaming consoles. That's really funny and not something I thought of at all when I saw him, but the rainbow colours do fit his suit while he's inside his light-filled laboratory, and I can't help but feel a circuit board is pretty apt for Mayuri too. Taguchi then describes why they chose to use 3D CGI for certain Bankai revealed in part 2, namely Shinji Sakashima Yokoshima Hapo Fusagari, Rose's Kinshara Butai, Toldan and Komamura's Kokujo Tengen Myo Dangai Joe, saying, We used CGI for Hirako's Bankai to show the rippling effect of the pink and golden lotus that is present on top of Buddhist altars. And then, in reference to the other two, he says, We used 3D CGI for these Bankai since the sword doesn't change but totally different entities do appear. We wanted to give them an ethereal, fleeting look. I'm pretty sure, certainly where Kokujo Tengen Myo Dangai Joe is concerned, the idea was brought up that CGI was used to make the towering monstrosity appear alien and eerie, and it's nice to hear that essentially confirmed here, even if I probably would have still preferred them to be hand-drawn overall. The same applies for Rose's dance troupe, though again I think they achieved what they were going for, the figures in question do look strange and unearthly. Though it's funny that he mentions they chose to use CGI for these Bankai because the sword doesn't change when Rose's Kinshara transforms into a conductor's wand in Bankai. There's a brief bit next about the imagery of the child's pinwheel in episode 14 that heralded the arrival of the Vandenreich, with Taguchi saying, this was done to portray that the innocent, peaceful days of the Seireite would disappear the instant the windmill stopped rotating. This was done from a cinematic point of view. Afterwards, Taguchi speaks briefly on the Sternritter meeting that we saw at the start of episode 15, which I was very excited to see crop up, going on to say, We wanted to add a scene in which the highest ranking member of the Sternritter, Ugram Hashwalf, calls everyone to order. This was done to show how cold the faction was. 
We had Hashwolf sit on a throne explaining very clearly that what they had to do was break the souls of the Shinigami. We also wanted to highlight how powerful Ugrim Hashwolf is as a commander. This scene has been portrayed to stand at par with the meetings called by Yamaji and Aizen. It was not fan service. It's interesting to me that he feels he has to clarify that it isn't fan service. Perhaps they anticipated the pretty overt comparisons to the Espada and to the captains to a lesser degree, and wanted to reiterate that there's an actual narrative reason for this scene to exist. To be honest, fan service or not, I loved it and I was very pleased with its inclusion. Taguchi then goes on to talk about the Bambis, stating, We wanted the Bambis to look like an idol group with magical girl transformations. We wanted Ichigo to get engaged in close-up hand-to-hand sword fights, so we expanded scenes with the Bambis. The pillars of light seen in Volstendish are actually the first stages of Sclaveri. Most of this is pretty self-explanatory. The team wanted Ichigo to engage in more fights, just like we all do, and so that's the reasoning behind the expanded battle scene featuring Ichigo versus Lil Toto, Meninas, and Giselle, which, to be honest, was probably my favourite part of that episode. I think it's safe to say the team absolutely succeeded in making the Bambis look like idle girls, specifically with their magical girl transformations. They pulled that off excellently, while also helping to flesh out the Bambis at the same time. However, it's this last line that I find the most intriguing. The pillars of light seen in Volstendish are actually the first stages of Sclaveri. Now, that implies that every single Sternritter, for the most part, is using Sclaveri when they activate their Volstendish, which doesn't necessarily make sense nor corroborate with what we've seen so far regarding half-formed Volstendish and then those that are enhanced with Sclaveri later on. However, Reddit user Arturo Plateado provides a slightly deeper look at this answer and helps to clarify the situation, writing... That's not really correct. One, because it's not a lore detail, and two, because he's talking about the Bambis only, not in general. Basically, it was written in the screenplay that the Bambis would activate Sclaveri before transforming into Volstendish, but the storyboarder episode director, Mitsutoshi Sato, didn't understand what Sclaveri is. So Taguchi explained it to him that it meant gathering Reishi from the surroundings to power up and transform into their second form, and put simply described it as the beginning of the activation of the Bambis Volstendish. That's all. So firstly, this statement about the Pillars of Light being an early stage of Sclaveri refers only to when the Bambis use their holy forms against Ichigo, which makes sense in the grander scheme of the Sternritter. But more importantly, it seems all this statement is referring to is the moment the Bambis prepare to use their holy forms. And as we saw in the episode, they do in fact all use Sclaveri first and foremost. That's when they adopt their magical girl poses and draw in energy before those Pillars of Light arise. So, interesting, but ultimately nothing new in the end. Next, Taguchi discusses the Kuchki siblings, noting in regards to Byakia that, much like Ichigo, we also wanted Byakia Kuchki to have close-up sword fights. Again, this makes total sense. Byakia doesn't really do anything in the second invasion, at least nothing on screen anyway, and so that's where his extended fight sequence comes from in episode 23. So both of these expanded fight scenes stem from the anime team wanting particular characters to actually get involved a bit more on screen, which I suppose makes sense. And then, speaking on Rukia and her Bankai, Taguchi said... I asked Kubo-sensei about Rukia's Bankai because I didn't understand why her appearance changes. So Kubo-sensei explained that an icy aura emanates from her blade, similar to the first dance, Tsukishiro, and pierces her through the centre. That's why it has been called a dangerous Bankai, and that's also why there's the word for punishment in her Bankai's name. Well now, that's an interesting subject to look at. Rukia's Bankai is never really explained in any great detail, and to be honest, I didn't necessarily think it needed to be. But actually, this is quite the revelation, and explains why Rukia's Bankai is so perilous. When she activates Bankai, we see a massive pillar of ice rise up into the sky. Admittedly, I never made the connection between that and Tsukishiro, but it's crazy to think that she is actually a target of this Bankai as well. Where Kubo notes that Rukia is pierced through the centre by this blast reminiscent of the first dance, does that mean she's frozen from head to toe, as though the ice has pierced her vertically, essentially anchoring her to the floor and making it impossible for her to move, rendering her statuesque? Or do Kubo's words mean Rukia is pierced horizontally, 
from the rear end of her Zanpak toe. Perhaps the ice runs through her hand and into her very core. Considering Sukishiro is explicitly referenced, I'm inclined to believe it's actually the former, and that the activation ritual locks her to the ground by sending a freezing blast up through her body. The fact that the punishment in the Bankai's name refers to Rukia, or perhaps to both Rukia and her opponent at the time, is pretty crazy too, and I wonder what Rukia could have done to deserve such a Bankai. Interestingly, Captain Rukia appears in the mobile game Bleach Brave Souls with a Bankai that allows her to move freely while transformed. I wonder if this is now retconned, or if this version of Rukia is depicting a future where she has fully mastered her Bankai and has somehow undone this mechanic mechanic that punishes her for using it. Only time will tell, I suppose. Next, Taguchi dives deep into Uryu's battle with the Zero Division and the new content that made up the majority of the finale to part two, with a lengthy answer that reads as follows. During the clash between Squad Zero and the Elite Guards, our focus was on Uryu, the secondary main character of the separation. Kubo Sensei was not able to draw Uryu as much as he wanted to, Uryu being the star of this arc because of page restraints and the weekly schedule. So we decided to give Uryu a role during the Squad Zero fights. We thought how exactly we could incorporate Uryu's actions during those battles and conveyed them to Kubo Sensei, and with his tremendous cooperation, we created the final two episodes. When we thought about the Bankai of the Squad Zero members, our first consideration was whose Bankai Bankai should we show? We decided on Senju Maru's because of her name A Thousand Hands, whose fighting style is facing several opponents at the same time. Since she targets multiple opponents, we thought it would be appropriate that the rest of Squad Zero would entrust her with taking out these powerful fighters. The animation team proposed this idea to Kubo Sensei, who readily created the storyboards and the visualizations of the gigantic weaving loom and its name and how it operated. Fortunately, there was a draft by Kubo Sensei already prepared, but not quite finalized. So we made episode 26 based on that. We poured our hearts into the last two episodes and our enthusiasm exploded and we felt we could deliver something that would make people say, yes, this is the essence of Bleach. Kubo Sensei also stated, if I had the flow going, I too would have chosen Senju Maru. So when I heard from the staff that they were going to have Senju Maru release her Bankai, I immediately accepted their suggestion. I felt that the animation team had a deep understanding of their work and of Bleach. I am very grateful for this, their sentiments are very much appreciated. It was their idea to have the rest of the Squad Zero members kill themselves, as they wanted to show it was okay to die in order to bring their enemies down with them. I also liked the way they had erased the marks of each member of Squad Zero at the moment of their deaths, it was a wonderful rendition. As for the way Kubo Sensei drew her Bankai, she initially creates a huge piece of fabric and lowers the handles of the sewing machine. As she utters the name of her Bankai, fabrics emerge from the loom, and an oval battlefield appears in the middle like a stitch or knot of threads. Needle stitch gates are formed and fabrics fill them on the right and left sides. Kubo Sensei called it a tan mono hall or a red battleground. Senju Maru uses her cloths to do whatever she likes with the enemy, constrict them, cut them, sew them to their deaths, while her real body is outside. The incarnations of her within her fabrics are illusions. The enemy is entirely enwrapped by whichever colour fabric they touch, and they shall be attacked according to the respective patterns. The phrase Senju no Tono has been mentioned, which means the escape of a thousand hands. In other words, only Senju Maru with her thousand hands can leave the oval battleground. This works figuratively, as Senju Maru completes sewing very swiftly and efficiently, like stitching simultaneously. We think we can now state with certainty that Kubo Sensei is a part of the animation team. Kubo says there is a great sense of familiarity with the animation team, but I am also nervous as well. We feel that we have created a relationship that has allowed us to express and respect each other's thoughts and ideas freely. Well, that's another long one, but I really enjoy how candid some of these answers are. 
The team seems to be totally cognizant, for the most part at least, of what readers wanted to see from the source material. The team mentioning that Uryu is the secondary main character of part two is very nice to see. It is definitely a bittersweet read somewhat, learning about how much Kubo really wanted to include in the original story but simply couldn't for one reason or another is a shame, but it's also great that he's having this redemptive turn with the Thousand Year Blood War arc anime. I love reading the team's rationale behind who should get to reveal their Bankai, and of course I'm extremely pleased they went with Senju Maru, and again their reasoning for that choice is totally sound. It's interesting though that it seems like the team only ever considered one member of the Zero Division revealing their Bankai. It's also interesting to learn that it was their idea that Squad Zero would kill themselves to allow Senju Maru to unlock the rest of her power. So does this mean in the original version of the story, Kubo simply had the Zero Division killed by the Schutzstoffel just like that? Anyway, to learn that Kubo himself created the storyboards for the battle and worked alongside the team to such a degree is very heartening to hear. And I love how much praise he has for them as well and how happy he must be with this adaptation. So it seems like the team came to Kubo and told him they wanted to use Senju Maru's Bankai, at which point he presented a draft he had worked on. Potentially back when the original story was running. I'm not sure, but either way it wasn't finalised. Interestingly though, Taguchi describes the Bankai as Kubo himself has drawn it, and from this we've learned even more new details regarding this ability. Like, for example, how the true Senju Maru remains outside of this fabric domain that she conjures. The Senju Maru we see inside the different cloths is only an illusion, which makes sense, and actually makes me wonder about what we've seen so far from part three, because we see Uryu taking on Senju Maru, which I assumed to be the real version of her, however they still seem to be encased within the red battleground of her Bankai, so I wonder if that is her or not, since I think she's supposed to be outside the Bankai right now. Hopefully answers are coming soon. But yeah, it is nice to hear them say that Kubo himself is a part of the animation team too. And finally, there was one last answer, this one regarding Getsuga Juji Show, and it reads, We wondered how to effectively show it, and Kubo Sensei told us that it involved creating a horizontal Getsuga with the left sword, and having that violently collide with a vertical Getsuga with the right. It has to form a cross. Thus, in the anime, we were able to display the firm footwork and stance of Ichigo, one foot in front of the other, with Jujisho. We made it look like a kintsugi pattern, kintsugi being an ancient art in Japan in which broken antiquities are repaired with molten gold lacquer so that not a piece is wasted. Not a lot to say there, but I love Kubo's own description of how Getsuga Jujisho works, this idea of the vertical Getsuga violently colliding with the horizontal one to fling off this massive attack is really awesome. And I also love the anime team's decision to make it appear like a kintsugi pattern too, that's really creative and a really nice idea. But that's it for the video guys and that's it for these answers. As always I really hope you enjoyed it and I hope you got some value out of it. Another massive thank you goes out to Reddit user Schneisel for compiling this post for providing the translated version. It is very much appreciated. Let me know down in the comments below how you feel about Taguchi's answers to these various talking points. To his answers regarding Irazu Sandor, regarding Senju Maru and the final battle of episode 26 and more. I'd love Love to hear all of your thoughts down in the comments below. And as always, I want to end the video by saying a massive thank you and giving a huge shout out to my wonderful supporters over on Patreon. I really do appreciate each and every one of you so, so very much. And if you want to support me over on Patreon as well, you can do just that to get your name in the credits like this and to get every video I release absolutely ad free. All right, guys, but until next time, I'll catch you later and I'll see you then.